I've played a lot of games on this channel now. Some mystery, some horror, some both. But I can't say I've played another game which got a reaction from me like Scratches did. Scratches was a 2006 point-and-click horror mystery that took me ages to get my hands on. But when I finally did, I felt that my experience was worth the wait. About a month ago, nearly three years after I first played the game, I decided I'd play it again with some of my friends, because I thought that they would enjoy it. This also afforded me the opportunity to play the game with a fresh perspective, and to see if it was everything that I remembered it to be. After this playthrough, I have come to the conclusion that Scratches is not just a game which I personally vibed with, but is also a masterclass in environmental storytelling, honest scares, and, above all else, subtlety in horror. In this video, I'm going to try to recreate my experience with Scratches for you, and in so doing, I want to try to capture and explain just why this old point-and-click horror game succeeded so well in chilling me to my core. First, I ought to up and tell you right away that this game is not for everyone. That's not to say it deals with sensitive subject matter or even extreme content. Quite the opposite, in fact. Scratches is a slow burn. The gameplay boils down to clicking on things and reading them. If it weren't for the puzzles and exploration, you really could just boil it down to a visual novel. A really good visual horror novel. Make no mistake, I do love this game. I love it the same way I love a good cup of tea. Unfortunately, tea is not for everyone, and there's plenty of people out there who'd rather have something sweeter or stronger than what they would just write off as hot brown water. And that's quite alright. Because, and I mean this in the least condescending way possible, Scratches was simply not made for those people. Scratches is made for those who can enjoy a good cup of tea and a good scary book. If you fit that description, then this is probably a game you would enjoy. And if you're not yet convinced, then stick around and maybe you will be. Otherwise, I wish you a very happy Family Guy Funny Moments compilation. If at any point in this video you decide you'd rather play Scratches for yourself than have me walk you through the game, then I'd encourage you to click off and go do so. Though I warn you, it is not an easy game to find. The first time I looked up Scratches on Steam, I was intrigued. It was a point-and-click horror mystery that took place in an old Victorian mansion. The screenshots looked crisp, the environment looked cozy. Parts of what I saw reminded me of the Her Interactive Nancy Drew games, a series which viewers of this channel will know that I am... familiar with. The game didn't advertise meta-existential horror, just a simple, spooky story in a simple, spooky house. I put it on my wishlist and told myself I would buy it the first minute it went on sale. But therein laid the problem. The game, in its entirety, having been completed almost 20 years ago, was not for sale. I figured it must have been a problem with the developer in Steam, but that theory fell through when I realized no one was selling the game anywhere. I'm not a fan of piracy on the best of days, especially not indie games, so instead of looking for places to download the game, I started looking for answers as to why I couldn't buy it. And unfortunately, I found them quite quickly. Some guy on Steam ran into the same problem that I did, so he went out onto the discussion boards and asked, what am I missing? Where is the game? To which a man tagged as the developer named Augustin Cordes responded, It's no longer for sale. Sorry. There's a legal issue with the IP. Eventually, when I have the opportunity, I will look into it. That comment was left April 8, 2019. Five years later, Scratches is still not for sale on Steam. After I had played the game in full, I actually got into contact with Mr. Cordes and learned that the legal issue was as simple as it was damning. A company called Got Game Entertainment purchased the game's re-release called Scratch's Director's Cut, and then GGE promptly went out of business. Since they went out of business while holding the rights to the game, Scratch's got sent to the prison realm of legal red tape. No one could buy the game anymore because there was no one to buy it from. The rights just ceased to exist. Not even Augustin could repossess the game, and he was the man who had just spent 13 years developing it. That's right. 13 years. Clearly, lots of labor and care had been put into its development, only for the game to now be damned into IP hell. I cannot imagine how horrible it would be for something that I worked so hard on to be taken away from me like that. Though it is linear and, at times, frustrating, I wish my friend Scratches were still for sale, if not more easily accessible today. It should not be such a Herculean task to get your hands on this game. So, without any other choice, I flew my Jolly Roger and set sail to an Abandonware site, where I found the old game and its decrepit majesty waiting for me. Now is your last warning for spoilers. Do take care. Scratches begins the same way that 70% of all Goosebumps do. You're moving into a new house. 
Only it's not 2001, you're not 11 years old, and you don't have a golden retriever named Trigger. Instead, the year is 1975, you are renowned horror novelist Michael Arthate, and your career has just springboarded with the successful release of your first book, The Vanishing Town. With the help of our real estate agent friend Jerry, we have just negotiated the purchase of the Blackwood House, an old, isolated Victorian mansion located in the English countryside, which we now plan to turn into a nice, quiet, factory of horror stories. Apart from Jerry, and a few more phone contacts, this game has no characters. It is just us, and our new home. When we first escape the opening credits, we are immediately introduced to Michael by way of his authory narrations. I arrived at Blackwood Manor one cold Saturday morning amidst a thick veil of fog. The, weather didn't the whole game is captioned like this. Every little subtitle is crammed with as much precise detail as brevity will allow. This is already a great device of subtlety in the game story, which I believe most players will catch on to pretty quickly. And that is that it is no coincidence that the player character is a novelist. This game is not about finding peace and quiet to finish our next book. This game is our next book. And we're reading it. Living it. One sentence at a time. The game won't confirm it for us until the very end, but the writing is on the wall. Something is going to happen in this house which will inspire us to write our next book. Whatever that might be, chances are it won't be good. Yeah, you'll have to get used to that. That happens with every door we open, the whole game. After a quick phone call from our pal Jerry, we settle into our bedroom upstairs and offload our luggage. In our suitcase, there's a brief letter from Jerry where he tells us a bit about the house's history. Originally built by architect James Blackwood, intended to house the Blackwood clan when ownership suddenly transferred to a local doctor in 1965, thereafter the house was empty by 1970 and had remained that way until we acquired it. He also mentions a rat problem. I also just want to say that there's a copy of Michael's latest book in the suitcase, which is very descript and even has a back cover that includes a teaser of the story, and some reviews left by critics. One of them likens Michael to H.P. Lovecraft, which is a bit funny because Michael's name is quite literally a play on Lovecraft. Augustin Cortez seems to really enjoy the works of H.P. Lovecraft. That's great, because I do too. Our problems begin when we try to finagle our first light switch of the game. Nothing happens. We give Jerry a ring and tell him that the lights don't work, but Jerry says he's one step ahead of us and that he's already called an electrician, who should be arriving any minute to assess the problem. We go outside to the front gates to meet this electrician, and instead find a rather curt letter in the mailbox. It seems he arrived early and quickly grew tired of waiting. He leaves us a written reprimand and suggests that we call Jerry. After telling Jerry that Mr. Electrician was in such a hurry, he suggests that maybe the breaker just tripped and we can fix it ourselves. All we need do is find the power box in the basement. Trouble is, the basement's locked, and it would take some cleverness and cunning to figure out where the key was being kept. So, in search of the key, I began my first thorough exploration of the Blackwood House. This place is equal parts charming and off-putting. Through one door, we'll find a guest bedroom with a glorious canopy bed, and the next door down the hall, you find an unfinished bathroom covered in bricks and overturned paint cans. One gets the impression that the house was never actually finished. In this first foray into Blackwood Manor, I found lots of strange things that begged for explanations, such as decades worth of newspapers stacked up in the attic, a spiraling journal entry left by a previous inhabitant, strange anatomical sketches found in a doctor's bag in our bedroom, and this fucking painting. But so far, Scratches is reading at I Spy Haunted House levels of scary. Nothing in Blackwood Manor is so spooky that it's worth writing home or even phoning Jerry about. That begins to change in the gallery. This is the room that is not like the others. One door over from our own bedroom, there is a massive gallery that houses all sorts of African artifacts. The guy who built this house, James Blackwood, was sort of like a weeaboo for all things natively African. He's got shields hanging on the walls, masks in all the display cases, ivory tusks in the cabinet, and all sorts of other knickknacks plucked straight from African civilizations. I did, however, take notice that one of the display cases had an empty space in it, though I quickly found a satisfactory explanation. Half hidden on a dresser in the corner of the room, there was a letter that a museum had written to Blackwood. It seemed that before he left the house, he had donated some of his collection to them, and they were grateful for the contribution. Thus, some of his displays were left empty. There was also a brief mention at the bottom of the letter of a specific tribe that Blackwood had been looking into, 
a foreign word that I'd never heard nor seen before. I tried and failed to pronounce it once before setting down the letter and putting it out of my mind entirely. After that, I stepped out of the gallery without another thought. I'll tell you straight up that I needed a spoiler to find the key to the basement. Who wouldn't? The clue is a photograph we find in the maid's quarters that shows a key hanging from a hook in the kitchen. Only when we go to that hook, the key isn't there anymore. How is this helpful? Because there's something else in the photo which is now absent too. A small clay pot. A more astute player than I may have recognized this pot as one in the hallway outside the kitchen. Go have a look and voila, there is the key, sitting at the bottom of the pot. Don't you feel so much better now? Well, not anymore you don't. After an hour of exploring the Blackwood house, the basement felt like the first room that was actually out to get me. It did not possess that eerie but inviting charm that the rest of the house had. Cold stone floors, a great big furnace, and one of the most shrill and uncomfortable soundtracks I've ever had to listen to. Listen to it. It's climbing. Becoming more intense. Of course, nothing's gonna happen when it reaches its climax. Right? There was a huge furnace covering most of the east wall. I didn't understand why, but I began to feel terribly uneasy. It had a menacing look to it. There was a water release and a drain on the ground, and the only light coming into the cellar is through these tiny, jail bar windows, and how is that horrible music still climbing? There's the fuse box, right on the wall on the way down the stairs. Open it up. Is the fuse intact? Is there a reset switch? Is something... wrong? Anything? Check them both. There's no sign that the fuse went or that anything happened to upset the electricity of the house. So why is it that none of the lights are working? Will this music ever stop? I wasn't going to hang around to find out. I phoned Jerry and told him that the breaker looked just fine. He was flabbergasted and questioned where I got my degree in electriconomics, so we argued for a moment about the situation, until we both came to an agreement that candles would have to do for the first night. Michael wasn't very thrilled about this idea. The man just loves his horror stories until he has to live in one. So we hung up the phone and began poking around the house for candles. I combed the whole first floor for candles, checking every cabinet, drawer, and end table to no avail. Funny enough, I found no shortage of candelabras and other decorative candle holders, but no candles in any of them. Why was that? Eventually, I had searched every room in the house except one which I had mistakenly walked past several times. That would be James Blackwood's private study. I don't think there was anywhere else in the house that gave me so much comfort. Grand fireplace, fancy mahogany desk, floor-to-ceiling bookshelf. The developer even tagged some of the books in the bookshelf with hitboxes that allowed Michael to identify them as books that he had read, many of them being H.P. Lovecraft books. For the first time, I actually felt a little jealous of Michael's situation. I could see myself puttering away in this study for hours, pretending to work on my writing while watching flames crackle from the comfort of an easy chair. Making myself at home and pretending to still look for candles, I found a journal on the impressive desk of Mr. Blackwood himself. I opened it up, leafed through it, and then groaned when I realized it was eight pages, maybe longer. I spam-clicked through the last page to close the book, and then I saw Michael's remark. I was breathless after finishing the book. The material was incredible. Material? As in, horror novel material? My interest was piqued. So, begrudgingly, I got comfortable and began to read the journal aloud. It was Blackwood's journal that he carried with him when he traveled to South Africa for work. He was finishing up a bridge construction at the time it was being written, and kept on talking about how excited he was to bring home the treasures he had been gifted in his travels. This explained where his collection upstairs began. That was Blackwood's first entry. The second entry begins to detail some trouble on the job. Apparently, there was a tribe of natives who had come out of the forest and begun to watch his men work on the bridge, wordlessly. They hadn't aggressed in any way, and weren't even carrying any weapons, but it was enough to make the workers feel uncomfortable. They made their concerns known to Blackwood, who then giddily began researching the strange tribe to find out what their deal was. In the third entry, James has spent a week asking around and conducting his own investigation, and has finally reached the conclusion that this was no ordinary tribe. These are the Dalmar, a mysterious bunch who some historians disputed the existence of altogether. All that was known about them was that they conducted very loud rituals, they did not get along with other people, 
and they did not carry weapons. Blackwood, being a weeb, decided he just had to know more about his little discovery, and became all the more emboldened by learning that the Dalmar were unarmed and seemingly pacifists. So he began to inch closer and closer to their village, day by day, driven on by his mad curiosity. Then one day, he caught the tribe in the middle of what seemed to be a ritual. He watched from afar as they banged on drums and danced in a circle, chanting aloud Dolam, Dolam, the same chant that they had been named for. Blackwood shuddered to think that he now knew as much about this tribe as any historian ever. More curious than ever, he watched on to see what he could learn. The following passage reads directly from James Blackwood's journal. Two of them walked away, still in that monotonous and slow manner, and in great contrast to the rest of the scene, into a shack. The next minute, they brought out into the open an odd-looking mask. Its shapes, colors, and overall looks, while unsettling, were mesmerizing, and I felt instantly hypnotized by it. It rendered my modest collection of African curiosities into dull and uninteresting items. The mask was very ominous, and the whole tribe seemed to greatly revere it. Soon they began to gather around it and move in circles, fluttering and chanting a guttural psalm. I'm not sure how to explain what happened next, as I feel my pulse is already throbbing. Words fail me to recount the most disturbing thing I have ever witnessed. One of the male villagers walked into the middle, near the mask, by his own will. It was an almost automatic act. All of a sudden, the remaining members became silent. The silence was so unnatural. Then, a few members separated from the people circling the mask and jumped on the single villager, beating him to death. To be completely faithful to the event, the small crowd tore him apart. They grabbed his legs in twos and threes and twisted them. His face was disfigured with their bare fingernails and teeth, and the torso soon disappeared under the frenzied tangle of hands. In a matter of a few minutes, the villager was turned into a red sack of bones. While the images of the sacrifice still haunt my thoughts, I still can't seem to forget about that mask. It was so deceptively simple, and yet perfect in its design. I haven't seen anything like it. I surely would love to take a better look. I feel the Dalmar, as dangerous as they are, could be the most important ethnic finding in decades. What I've seen today is crying for further investigation. And I can't just leave them like that. I would never forgive myself. And the mask. That mask. There, the book ended. Nothing had happened between my opening and closing of the book. And yet, it felt as though something in the house had changed. I don't know what you would have done in my situation, but I bet many of the other people who played Scratches, and actually read this whole journal, then did exactly what I did. I forgot all about the candles, all about my objective, and I went back upstairs to have another look in that strange gallery. As soon as he made mention of it in the journal, something began gnawing at the back of my mind. James Blackwood didn't... take that mask back home with him, did he? I braced myself for a jump scare when I went up to the gallery, especially when I had to endure that damn door-opening animation for the tenth time, but I didn't get one. To be fair, I'm not even sure what they would have scared me with, a haunting death mask floating in the doorway. Once inside, those drums came back to me, and I had a good, careful look around the room. Where is it, I wondered. There were plenty of masks in the room, some on the walls, some in the cases. Sure, they were freaky, but none were so... How did Blackwood put it? Mesmerizing? After rubbing my face against the wall for long enough, I began to suspect that I might be overreacting. Michael's nonchalance had all but confirmed it. He's a very talkative protagonist, always spouting off little observations left and right, but he didn't have a thing to say about the book, the gallery, or my fears about a mask. After my thorough search, I had conclusively found nothing which I hadn't seen before. Certainly no evidence that any of these artifacts were once used in some kind of ritualized bloodletting. So why, then, did finding nothing somehow make me feel worse? By the time the sun had begun to set, I had combed through every room in the house and had not found one single candle. It was incredible. 
There was at least one decorative candle holder in every room of the house. Some had as many as three. But no candles. None whatsoever. It was so eerie. It read as if the house had once been full of candles. But then, for whatever reason, someone had rounded them all up and taken them away. I shuddered to think of what their reasoning might be. We ended up giving Jerry a call and telling him as much as I've just told you, to which Jerry apologized for setting us up in such an ill-prepared house. All right, listen. The town isn't too far away. No more than 20 minutes drive. If you can't find some candles there, I'll eat my hat. You'll eat your whole closet. So, Michael locked up the house, opened the gate, started his car, and then... He left the lights on. This actual horror author just left the lights on in his car and ran down the battery. He is actually living one of his own cliches. Now we're stuck here and the sun's almost gone down. We crawl back into the house and made one last phone call to Jerry to fill him in on just how shit the situation is. Jerry is a can-do guy though, and he assures us that it'll be all right. Tomorrow he'll drive up here himself, we'll meet with the electrician, get a bite to eat, and then enjoy the afternoon sipping cold beers up back in the garden. On that reassuring note, we hang up on Jerry and head upstairs to our room for the night. We crawl into bed, where we will hopefully dream of cold speckled hens and warm rays of sunshine in the garden tomorrow. Ah, oh, shit. The first time I played this, I stood still for ten seconds. I thought I was watching a cutscene. What is that sound? What is this effect? Try to go back to sleep and the game says you can't, that the banging of a hammer is keeping you awake. And the game isn't lying either. Someone somewhere is hammering away. Common sense told me that this was a nightmare, but knowing so didn't make it any easier to investigate. After taking a couple steps, I realized that the game was scripting me and would only allow me to move in one direction, and that was toward the gallery. Entering the gallery here is a moment that I clearly remember this game for. It's almost like an anti-jump scare. A scare that gets you when you're ready to see it, instead of suddenly thrusting itself before you. This game is good at those. When you enter the gallery, the banging sounds stop. Something in the room is different. That's not supposed to be there. That's where the cabinet with the ivory tusks is supposed to be. But now there's a door here, in what is obviously my dream? Is this the game's way of telling me that there's a hidden door behind the cabinet? If so, how am I seeing something in my dreams that I don't know about in my conscious state? And on top of that, why has it been boarded up? This game borders just enough on the supernatural that the event almost feels plausible. In front of the door, I found a hammer on the floor. But when I went to pick it up, it all went to black. Now we're awake for real, but the noises haven't stopped. Muffled in the distance is the game's titular scratching. These must be the rats that everyone warned us about. You get up from your seat and inch toward the fireplace, where the noises seem to become louder. Somewhat unintuitively, the game expects you to use your stethoscope on the cold brick to listen closer. They're coming from below. The music begins to develop as you go down the stairs. This isn't the drone of the nightmare. It's more like Herobrine music, and I hate it extra. The scratches persist as you go downstairs to the living room fireplace, which is of course connected via chimney to your own, and they become much, much louder this time when you have a listen with the stethoscope. There's no doubt about it. The scratches are coming from the basement. I hadn't much liked the basement in broad daylight, but now, in the dead of night, I was considering saving and quitting. Whatever was down there sounded way too big to be a rat. Ever so cautious, I made my way to the kitchen, hovered my hand over the basement doorknob, and then... Michael came to his senses. I thought about investigating, but then I realized the basement would be pitch black at this time. I couldn't go down there without some light. What was there left to do but go back to bed? Even now, the harsh scratches had begun to soften and disappear into the rest of the still night. I was grateful.
The next day, we awoke to thunder and lightning. A downpour had begun, and it showed no sign of letting up any time soon. Michael decided pretty quickly that the plans made the previous day, the electrician, the garden, the beers, those had all been dashed. No one would be able to make it up here in this weather. Once again, we would be alone in the house. Jerry confirmed as much when we called him, saying the roads had been washed out. It wasn't all bad news, though. I, for one, found the rainy ambience and change of soundtrack to be very welcome. I felt more acquainted with the house now. Now that my good chum Jerry had been caught up to speed, it was time to indulge my investigative impulse. I went back upstairs to take another good look at that cabinet in the gallery. By day two, this gallery has had more character development than Ray Palpatine had in three movies. Even the music has had a unique change. Now it is a somber but interrogative piano piece that sounds strangely... incomplete. As if some notes are missing from the song by design. The cabinet in the corner of the room definitely appears to have some hitboxes, ones that were not so easy to spot before. If a player is clever, or lucky enough, to try the right items on these hitboxes, you can pry off the baseboard using a kitchen knife, revealing two caster wheels. The cabinet can roll. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere without any lubricant, seeing as both wheels are rusted in place. Oh well. Guess we'll never know. Day 2 really begins to progress when you find a key in a very well-hidden safe in the other bedroom. As it happens, this key opens one of the locked doors on the third floor, which will allow me a perfect segue to finally fault this game for something. What the fuck are these puzzles? I have never seen such narrow, nonsensical, Rube Goldberg, Scooby-Doo solutions to puzzles. And if you think this is bad, this chicanery, believe me when I tell you the puzzles will only become more obscure and more difficult to solve. On the first day of the game, Michael encounters this locked door and says something different from the usual, it's locked. Michael says, it's locked, but I can see the key sticking out of the lock on the other side of the keyhole. That's cool, Michael. What do you want me to do about it? What he wants me to do about it is complete and utter bullshit. You have to take a newspaper from the hallway, slide it underneath the door, and then very gently knock the key out of the keyhole with a drill so that the key lands on the newspaper on the other side of the door. And then, ever so carefully, you have to drag the newspaper back under the door, bringing the key with it. All of this to open one door? Guess again? The key still gets caught on the fucking door! Damn, whoever said that old trick worked anyhow? What old trick? You're smoking crap! To reiterate, the game makes you do this bullshit with the newspaper and the keyhole, just so that you can still be locked out of the room. I'm not sure if it's mandatory to progress, but even if it isn't, who makes a puzzle like that? Anyhow, let's put that aside, because now it's day two, and we have the spare key to open the spare room. We open it up to find... A studio. Someone had been busying away up here with a hobby in paint. Judging by the nature of the paintings, it seems they were a regular Pikmin. There are some interesting finds in this room and the other one adjoining it, such as a good length of rope, an oil can, and the exact same hammer we saw in our dream. There's also some oil for a lamp, so now we can navigate dark spaces freely. Yippee. But, once again, there is one find in this room which stands out above the others. Shunted aside on a table by the dried up paint, you can find several pages of blueprints. As it happens, these are the blueprints which James Blackwood himself drew up when he designed his own home. Michael, being the owner of this house now, takes particular interest in the original blueprints and has something to say for every room in the house you click on. That was the study with the gorgeous collection of books. The smallest of the hallways. The kitchen, evidently. The staircase leading to the basement. I thought this was just a cute little Easter egg of an item, with a fun segue just to hear Michael's opinions of the house. Until... That's odd. I don't remember there being a room there. The blueprints clearly show another room on the second floor hallway that doesn't exist. But it can't even be the strange door we saw attached to the gallery in our dream, because the gallery is on the other side of the hall. What the hell is going on in this house? If you go back down to the hallway, you now have the opportunity to examine the place where the door ought to be. With the help of your handy-dandy kitchen knife, 
You can scrape off the wallpaper and find a bricked up doorway. There's all the proof we need. There is a hidden room behind this wall, but for whatever reason, it has been condemned and concealed. Were it me, I would probably just let it go. Michael Arthate, though, knows no limits when it comes to satisfying his innate curiosity. Believe you me, I did not figure this out without the help of a guide. To enter the hidden room, we have to climb to the top of the tower attached to Blackwood Manor, and tie that rope we found around a sconce bolted to the wall. Then, with the help of our hammer, we must break a hole into the side of the tower and thread the entire rope out of the crack. Finally, Michael traces his steps down the tower, opens one of the several windows, and grabs the rope which he just threw out the crack above. That's right. Michael is preparing to rappel out of the tower into a window on the second floor in the howling rain. Dude, I could never. Michael has a brief moment of self-reflection right before leaping out the window into the storm, in which he kind of asks himself, what the hell am I doing? He plays a little devil's advocate, but ultimately decides that there is nothing that can talk him out of it. He has to know what the Blackwoods are hiding. I remember very clearly getting hit with spine chills when I first arrived in this room, quickly understanding that this was a place I was never supposed to know about. Tell me, as you watch this, what gives it away first? The furniture or the soundtrack? The Cradle, Rocking Horse, and Eerie Music Box song remove all doubt. We are in a nursery. At this point in the game, we've learned a great deal about the Blackwood family, but not once has there ever been any mention of them having children. And now, finding this room, I actually felt ashamed. I was expecting to uncover some dark history or secret devil worship site, but instead I just uncovered a painful memory, one which this family had clearly gone to great lengths to bury. There wasn't anything to take away from the room except a few sad observations, Tucked away in a drawer, there was a birth certificate, though the child's name had been crudely redacted. All that could be inferred from the ledger was that James and Catherine Blackwood delivered a child in this house in August of 1961. Judging by the state of the nursery, it was very likely the poor child did not survive infancy. Enough with prolonging the inevitable. It's time to return to the gallery. I owe the left wheel then the right wheel, and then with two hands, I pulled the cabinet right out from the wall. There it was, the door I had seen in my dreams, boarded up and hiding. The hammer made quick work of the boards, and with a little leverage the thing was unhindered, ready to be open. I had a pretty good idea by this point of what I was going to find in here. The room was impenetrably dark, total blackness. For the first time, I was given license to use my lantern and strike one of the few matches Michael had brought with him. We lit the lantern, held it up, and... An odd-looking African mask was positioned in the middle of the storeroom. Its presence made me feel terribly uncomfortable. Michael doesn't make the connection immediately, but we've been paying attention. And as such, we understand the gravity of this situation. This is THE mask. The one that Blackwood saw used in a horrific ritual that he recounted in full detail. And after that horrifying experience, a thing which he quite literally described as the most disturbing thing I have ever seen, something still possessed him to take that mask and bring it home to England. For a time, he might have even put the gruesome thing on display with the rest of his collection, until something happened which encouraged him to stow it away in a cupboard under the stairs, board up the door, and hide it from sight. And now our own prying curiosity has uncovered the mask, undone its shackles, undone our defenses. Are we still safe? Were we ever? A series of letters in the room remove all doubt. This is the mask of the Dalmar tribe. There are two sets of writing. 
One is James' private diary, and another is a letter he wrote to Dr. Christopher Milton, his close friend. There's a great deal of speculation and lore buried in these letters, but to cut to the chase, Blackwood is telling Christopher that he is not making fun or kidding around. There is some darkness that has followed him out of Africa, and he believes it to be connected to this mask. What I was thinking of when I took it is beyond me. It was probably a vicious streak of greed, but I can see clearly now. It represents evil, and I'm truly convinced this evil can somehow take shape and punish those who have disgraced it. I did. And now I must face the consequences. Let's just recap. The developer Cordez placed one journal in the study downstairs that contained a scary story with an ambiguous ending, alluding to the author being fascinated by an unpictured mask. That was it. There wasn't an immediate jump scare to pay off the story. There wasn't a mask in the gallery upstairs that Michael walks in and clocks as, oh, this could be the mask from the story. No. Michael never said anything about the reading, besides what great material this would make. He doesn't even bring up the story to Jerry, whom he talks to about literally everything. Through these means, and several others, Cordez has succeeded in scaring me in a special, intangible kind of way. He got me to scare myself. Ever since I read that story and began to wonder about the gallery upstairs, my whole perspective of the game changed. I became hyper fixated on the house and all its goings on and I began to read deeply into every little detail that didn't quite add up. And instead of pitching underhand, the game continued to reward this hypervigilance by leaving me breadcrumbs. Tiny, subtle things which did not confirm my suspicions, but seemed to acknowledge that something was amiss, like the empty display case in the gallery, the museum's letter to Blackwood in which the Dalmar are mentioned, the nightly disembodied scratching noises that punctuate every nightmare, the maddening journal written by Christopher Milton where he says he's been hearing whispers coming from down the hall not one, but several rooms that have been locked up and hidden for different reasons, and the improbable, if not impossible, lack of candles in a house that is positively brimming with candelabras. And we still don't even know why that is. Another guy might play this game and think nothing of it. It's perfectly believable that some of these little beats just wouldn't hit another player like they did me. But I remain amazed. Every little point this game threw at me landed immaculately. In allowing me to follow these breadcrumbs and let my theories simmer, this game got me immersed in ways that AAA RPGs weren't even able to do. But now that my fears had been realized, and I'd confirmed that I wasn't alone, but was sharing this house with a storied, evil, perhaps even haunted mask, I felt myself deeply hooked into the story, and terribly afraid to continue. Michael calls Jerry and finally confides in him that something strange was going on with the Blackwood family, and Jerry straight up blurts out, you're kidding me. A murder? An old-fashioned murder. You'd probably love the details, but sadly I don't know very much. It seems the owner, James Blackwood, I think, went mad and killed his wife. I do remember the date, though. May, 1963. What a thing for him to keep from us. With very little prompting, we take to the newspapers in the attic and begin to search for some dates we've heard referenced throughout the day. First, we found an article dated 1961 by the Village Herald, which mentions sad tidings from the Blackwood House. They did, indeed, have a child who did not survive childbirth. This was then topped with even sadder tidings when two years later, James Blackwood murdered his wife Catherine. The story claimed that the maid, a Miss Eva Mariani, saw James hiding the body in a plot dug out in the garden. A particularly sickening detail of the account was Mrs. Blackwood's cause of death. As observed by the maid, her throat had been ripped open. This didn't add up. We've seen inside James Blackwood's head in this era by way of his journals. The man was a bit neurotic, and certainly grew superstitious, but nothing ever hinted that he would become a murderer. And why murder his wife of all people? Could he have suffered some psychotic snap after they lost their child? Or maybe it was the fantastic option. Maybe James Blackwood was right about the mask. Maybe something had followed him out of Africa. Something evil that intended on punishing him and the ones that he loved. Michael ends day two by doing something that I began to doubt he was even capable of. 
sitting down at his desk and actually working on his book. Hours pass as he clicks away on his typewriter, and the end result is that you get to read a page of his frustrated manuscript. He's kind of just rambling on about something, but it's difficult to tell what. He looks at the clock and decides that he better get some sleep. So, we crawl into bed again, and hope that tonight will be more restful than the last. Something didn't feel right. There's no banging hammer, no scratching in the chimney, just eerie silence and a dash of hero brine music. Something didn't feel right is the only thing Michael has to say, but it was all the prompt that I needed. All right. I'm just gonna hold my breath real quick. Let's go have a look in the gallery. I, re I really don't want any business in here. Anything spooky and nefarious going on in the little mask room? Oh, shit. No. 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 No, it's gone. The mask is gone. The mask is gone. It's not here. Ah! This was not the same as Freddy Fazbear giving me a wet willy. This was not the same as turning around and seeing Slenderman in the distance. This jump scare was intimate. One of the great advantages that point-and-click games have when it comes to making horror is that every screen transition, inherently, is a jump cut. Which means all one needs to do to turn taking a step into a jump scare is replace the anticipated screen with something the player won't expect. In short, this is a game which has already had hundreds of opportunities to jump scare me. Plenty of times I'd become so nervous and tense that I was expecting to get that inevitable jump scare around every corner, especially whenever I had to open a door. But instead, Scratches was patient. It deceived me yet again. It passed up so many opportunities to make me jump that I began to wonder if it had the nerve to jump scare me in the first place. And now, a little past the halfway point of the game, it had finally cashed in. It waited for me to let my guard down, and then it got me. And it didn't just get me. I don't care if it sounds silly, but that shit made my hair stand on end. Booga, booga, booga! I was genuinely, for a moment, terrified, because Augustin Cordez had succeeded in putting me in this house, putting me in this dream, and teaching me to be afraid of a seemingly inanimate object. I will always view this moment as not just one of the only jump scares that did not make me feel like an exploited idiot for flinching, but also as the best jump scare in any game I have ever played. I bolted up in my bed. Of course it was a nightmare. I half suspected it to begin with, but that didn't make the reveal any less scary. But now, we have a new problem. One which the game has promised me is not a dream. It's the dead of night, and the scratching noise is back. It's coming from the fireplace, which feeds down into the chimney, which feeds all the way to the furnace in the basement. But this time, I've got an oil lantern to light my way. So I have no excuse but to go and seek out the source of the scratching. And now, I will exercise some restraint and end the video here. Scratches is a little past halfway over at this point, maybe just halfway if you include the bonus chapter, and I see no need to spoil the game any further. Make no mistake, Scratches has not yet peaked. It still has several tricks up its sleeve, which I can't just divulge to you in such an unceremonious way. Hell, you haven't even seen the crypt, chapel, or greenhouse yet. I simply enjoyed this game too much to betray all the good times it trusted me with. It's a sad thing that this game is so buried in obscurity by means that are unfair, but I am pleased to report that I do have an up note to end this video on. And that would be that Augustin Cordez has been developing a new game titled Asylum, which he has described as a spiritual successor to Scratches. The game hasn't released yet, but judging from its Steam page, it looks like it's getting ready to drop soon. There's several trailers, a slew of promising screenshots, and under inspirations for the game, 
Cordes has cited the works of H.P. Lovecraft, weird Euro horror films, and Hammer films as great influences. I can't speak to weird Euro horror, but these two things are like my literal favorite things ever. H.P. Lovecraft always gets my attention, but citing Hammer films too as an inspiration for the same project? It, it, that's just going to be the perfect game to me. It means a lot to me that you made it to the end, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on my appraisal of this diamond in the rough. Do scratches seem to you like as good of a game as I've made it out to be? Or am I just terribly partial to it after the unexpectedly immersive experience it provided me with? Bonus points if you've played the game yourself. I've left you all a link in the description to the Steam page for Asylum, as well as Augustine's Discord server in case either of those interest you. And if you'd like to know how the rest of Scratches plays out, but can't see yourself playing the game, though I would highly recommend it, I have also left a slew of links to other YouTubers' walkthroughs of the game. These could help satisfy your own curiosity. Yes, one of them is my own. You have all indulged my hyperfixation on this game to the fullest extent, and I thank you all for your time. Be well, stay warm, and vote for Holt.